I'm not here because I'm a historian or an art historian or an archaeologist. I'm here because the Ayodhya issue bothers me as much as it bothers you. We all realize the gravity of the situation, but at the same time, we know very little about Ayodhya or its history. So I decided to do some research of my own. I started visiting libraries, reading books. I also started gathering and maintaining date-wise data of the important happenings. This is an attempt to present the information before you in order to help you to form your own opinion. Ayodhya, the word literally means unconquerable or unvanquishable. It has a history of wars and struggles for over 2,200 years since 150 BC. But even before that, the mention of Ayodhya as a capital city established by Manu, an emperor of the solar line, and the birthplace of Sri Ram can be found in Sanskrit literature, including the most revered epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Oshano Nama Mudita Smito Janapado Maha Nibishtaha Sarayutire Prabhuta Dhanadhanava Ayodhya Nama Nagari Patrasila Loka Vishruta The description of Ayodhya in Ramayana is beautifully rendered into verse by Mr. Griffiths, who was a principal of the Banaras College in the late 19th century. He writes, Her ample streets were nobly planned and streams of water flowed to keep the fragrant blossoms fresh that strewed her royal road. There many a princely palace stood in line on level ground, her temple and triumphal ark and rampart banner crowned. Their golden turrets rose on high above the waving green of mango groves and blooming trees and flowery knots between. On battlement and gilded spire, the pennon streamed in state, and warders with the ready bow kept watch at every gate. <laughs> The kingdom of Koshal was ruled by King Dashrath, who is believed to be 56th in descent from Raja Manu. His three wives, Kaushalya, Sumitra and Kaikai, lived in their respective palaces. Sri Ram is believed to have been born in the Kaushalya Mandir, which is believed to be the birthplace of Sri Ram or the Ram Janmasthan. In Brahmanda Puran, Ayodhya is described as holiest of the six holy cities. Ayodhya Mathura Maya, Kashi Kanchi Yavantika, Ketaha Punyata Mahaprokta, Purina Bhutta Bhutta Maha. Maharshi Vyas refers to the story of Ram in the Vanopakhyan of his epic Mahabharata. Thus, the city of Ayodhya and Sri Ram have been held in veneration by the residents of this land for centuries. Almost 200 years after Alexander the Great, during Mauryan rule, when Buddhism was flourishing, came the Greek king Menander. He embraced Buddhism and pretended to be a monk. The transformation of the monk to that of an invader was stunning. He attacked Ayodhya and destroyed the temple on the Janmasthan site. Menander was defeated by Raja Dhyumatsen 
of the Shrunga Vansha. Within three months, Menander himself was killed in the war and Ayodhya was liberated. The Janmasthan temple was reconstructed by King Vikramaditya. History knows of six different Vikramadityas. Historians have different opinions as to which Vikramaditya constructed the temple. Some say it was Vikramaditya the original who defeated the Shakas and conquered Ujjain in 58 BC and after whom the Vikram Samvat calendar system is named. Others attribute the reconstruction to Skandagupta, who also called himself Vikramaditya and built the temple in the late 5th century AD. However, it is generally accepted as P. Carnegie mentions in his historical sketch of Faisabad that Vikramaditya's main clues in tracing the ancient city were the river Sharayu and the shrine still known as Nageshwarnath, which is dedicated to Lord Mahadev. It is also generally accepted that Vikramaditya constructed about 360 temples in and around the city of Ayodhya. The tradition of veneration to Sri Ram has continued in the Hindu society in one form or another. The earliest known inscription to testify to this is the Nasik cave inscription of the Shatavahan kings. The celebrated Sanskrit dramatist Bhas identifies Sri Ram with his Archanavatar. He writes, Namo Bhagavate Evolution of the tradition of worship of Sri Ram as an incarnation of Vishnu is evident in the early Rama shrines and inscription. The 4th century shrine at Ramtek, the Gandhar inscription in 423 AD, the Chalukya inscription in 543 AD, Mamallapuram inscription in the 8th century AD, Amba Mata temple near Jodhpur in 11th century AD, Ram temple at Mukundpur in Reva district in 1145 AD, Hansi inscription in 1168 AD, Rajiv Lochan temple at Rajim in Raipur district are some of them. In 12th century, at least five temples existed in Ayodhya. They were Gupta Hari at Gopratar Ghat, Chandra Hari at Sargadwar Ghat, Vishnu Hari at Chakratirth Ghat, Dharma Hari at Swargadwar Ghat, and Vishnu Temple on what is known as the Janmabhumi site. Mahmud Ghaznavi looted and destroyed the temple of Somnath and went back. His nephew Salar Masood advanced in the direction of Ayodhya. On 14th June 1033, Masood reached Baharaj, 40 kilometers from Ayodhya. The people united under the leadership of Raja Suhel Dev. Suhel Dev's army attacked Masood, defeated his army, and killed Masood himself. Abdul Rahman Chishti writes in the biography of Masood titled Mirate Masoodi Maud ka samna hai, firak suri najdik hai. Hunudo ne jamao kiya hai, inka lashkar be intaha hai. Sudur Nepal se pahado ke niche ghagra tak fauj mukhalif ka parao hai. Masood ki maut ke baad ajmer se muzaffar khan turant aya, par wah bhi maar diya gaya. Arab Iran ke har ghar ka chirag bujha. So the tradition of Ram worship continued. The various literary and scriptural sources seem to have culminated in the Ayodhya Mahatma, composed somewhere in the 12th or 13th century AD. The Ayodhya Mahatma describes the various holy spots and extols the pilgrimage to the city of Ayodhya as the best means of salvation. <laughs>
Ayodhya Mahatma profusely eulogizes the Janmabhumi shrine and gives its exact location. The merits of a visit by a devotee observing the vow on the Ram Naomi day to the Janmasthan are elaborately described. It is said that a man who has visited the Janmasthan will not be born again, even if he does not offer gifts or practice ascetism or go on pilgrimages or offer sacrifice offerings. Lakhs of Hindus kept going to Ayodhya passionately and devoutly believing in whatever was stated in the Ayodhya Mahatma. Then in the year 1526, an invader from across the borders invaded India. He hailed from the province of Fargana in Central Asia. His name, Zahiruddin Muhammad Babur. On 16th of March 1527, Babur defeated Rana Sangha and conquered Delhi. That was the beginning of the Mughal era in India. Soon thereafter, Babur's lieutenant Mir Banki, on Babur's express orders, marched towards Ayodhya. The text of Babur's orders to Mir Banki have been printed in the 6th July 1924 issue of the Modern Review published from Delhi. It reads, Shahin Shah Hind Malikul Jaha Baad Shah Babar Ke Hukm Vahazrat Jalal Shah Ke Hukm Ke Bamujib Ayodhya Me Ram Janma Bhoomi Ko Mismar Kar Ke Uski Jagay Par Usi Ke Malwe Va Masale Se Masjid Tamir Kar Ne Ki Ijazat De Di Gai Hai Bajari Ye Is Hukm Naame Ke Tum Ko Bata Or Ittila Se Aagah Kiya Jata Hai Ke Hindustan Ke Kisi Subay Se Koi Hindu Ayodhya Na Jane Paave Jis Shaks Par ये सुबह हो कि वो वहाँ जाना चाहता है, उसे फौरन गिरफ्तार करके दाखिले जिंदा कर दिया जावे। हुक्म का सख्ती से तामिल हो, फर्ज समझकर। By 23rd March 1528, 1,73,000 people had sacrificed their lives defending the Janmasthan site. They fought bravely and held Mir Banki at bay, but ultimately they lost. Mir Banki set about to carry out Baba's orders to the letter. He demolished the temple and constructed a mosque at the very spot. When Mir Banki's men were constructing the mosque, it is said that the day's work used to get undone every night. Baba himself writes about this in his autobiography, Tujuk Babri. Ayodhya ke Ram Janma Bhoomi Mandir ko mismar karke jo masjid tamir ki ja rahi hai. उसकी दीवारें शाम को आप से आप गिर जाती हैं। इस पर मैंने खुद जाकर सारी बातें अपनी आंखों से देखकर चंद हिंदू अवलियाओं फकीरों को बुलाकर ये मसला उनके सामने रखा। इस पर उन लोगों ने कई दिनों तक गौर करने के बाद मस्जिद में चंद तरमीमें करने की राय दी, जिनमें पांच खास बातें थीं, यानी परिक्रमा रहने दी जाए, सदर गुंबद के दरवाजे में लकड़ी लगा दी जाए, मीनारे गिरा दी जाए, और हिंदू महात्माओं को भजन पाठ करने दिया जावे। उनकी राय मैंने मान लिया, तब मस्जिद तैयार हो सकी। Baba's otherwise meticulous diary does not have any record for the period 12th of April 1528 to 18th September 1528. The pages are said to have been lost in the storm of 17th May 1529 or during Humayun's stay in the desert in 1540. On 3rd June 1528, Devidin Pandey from Sanethu and Mahabat Singh attacked Mir Banki's men. Devidin Pandey alone is said to have killed 600 men in five days. Mir Banki survived miraculously and he himself killed David. On the day of Eid in 1529, Rana Ranvijay tried to liberate the Janmasthan site from the clutches of Mir Banki, but in vain. Babur died in the year 1530. His son Humayun succeeded the throne. During his regime from 1530 to 1556, Rani Jairaj Kumari and Swami Maheshwaranand made ten attempts to regain the Janmasthan site. The control of the Janmasthan site kept on intermittently passing from the hands of one side to that of the other. 
Akbar succeeded Humayun and turned his kingdom into an empire. During his rule, there are said to have been 20 outbreaks when Hindus fought relentlessly to regain the control of the Janmasthan site. Akbar granted permission to the Hindus in recognition of their rights to construct a platform right next to the mosque and offer puja there. The platform is today known as the Ram Chabutra. Akbar also introduced a silver coin by the name of Ram Taka with the images of Ram and Sita on either side of it. One of the courtiers of Akbar presented him with a Ramayan in a pictorial form. Abul Fazl, the author of Akbar Nama and Aine Akbari, categorically associates Awadh with the residential place of Ram and one of the holiest places of antiquity. Meanwhile, during Jahangir's rule, William Finch visited Ayodhya somewhere between 1608 and 1611. William Finch was a traveler who has confirmed the existence of the ruins of Ram Court or the Castle of Ram. In his report, which has been quoted and reproduced by William Foster in his book, Early Travels in India. After 1658, Aurangzeb's lieutenant Jabaz Khan attacked Ayodhya but was defeated. Guru Gobind Singh's Akalis fought against his army near Ayodhya at Rudali and Sadat Ganj. In 1664, Aurangzeb himself went to Ayodhya and killed 10,000 people and demolished the Ram Chabutra. But even thereafter, the Ram Navmi celebrations continue. There were fights between Nawab Salamat Khan and Raja Gurdat Singh of Amethi and Rajkumar Singh of Pimpra. Sadiq Ali also had to face five attempts made to recapture the Janmasthan site. In 1751, the second Nawab of Awadh, Sabdar Jang, invited Malhar Rao Holkar, the eminent courtier of the Marathas, to fight against the Pathans. Malhar Rao Holkar put a condition that in return, Sabdar Jang would hand over the three holy cities of Ayodhya, Kashi, and Prayag to the Hindus. Again in 1756, Shuja Uddawla asked for Maratha help when the Afghans invaded Delhi. The Maratha agent in his court demanded the transfer of the three holy cities. Shuja Uddawla agreed to it. Unfortunately, the Marathas lost the most bloody war at Panipat, and the Maratha strategy to retrieve Ayodhya fizzled out. The fate of Ayodhya and Ram Janam Bhumi remained in the dark for another century. Numerous Muslim and European writers during this century confirm that a mosque had been built by Mir Banki on Baba's orders after demolishing a temple at Ramkot. They also confirm the existence of the tradition of Ram worship at the Janmasthan site. They also confirm the existence of the practice of celebrating Ram Naomi with great gatherings of people from all over India. Let us have a look at some of these books and their authors. The History and Geography of India by Joseph Typhon Thaler, 1785. Safiyai Chahal Nasai Bahadur Shahi by the daughter of Bahadur Shah, late 17th or early 18th century. Report by Montgomery Martin, a British surveyor, 1838. The East India Company Gazetteer by Edward Thornton, 1854. Hadikai Shahada by Mirza Jan in 1856. In this relatively peaceful period, there were repeated attempts to recapture the Janmasthan. Five such attempts were made 
by Baba Uddhav Das, Baba Ramchandra Das and others during Nasiruddin Haider's and Wajid Ali Shah's rule. In the year 1857, when Amir Ali declared a jihad and attacked the site of Hanuman Gadhi with 170 men. However, they were defeated and the jihad wiped out. Then came the Indian War of Independence of 1857, when the Hindus and Muslims fought side by side against the British imperialists. This time, another Amir Ali, a Maulvi, and the leader of the rebels of Abad convinced the native Muslims and decided to hand over the Janmasthan site to the Hindus. However, the British imperialists, using their Machiavellian tactics, arrested Amir Ali and Baba Ramchandra Das and hanged both of them by a tamarind tree which still stands in Ayodhya as a mute witness of the tragic event. In the Encyclopedia of India by the then Surgeon General Edward Balfour, it is mentioned that there were three mosques on the site of the temples. These were the Janmasthan, the Swargadwar, and the Tretaka Thakur. We have seen earlier some books and authors. Apart from these, there are other sources of reference which are also worth looking at. Let us have a look at them. These are the Fasanai Ibrat by Mirza Rajabali Beg of Surur, 1867. Tarihi Awad by Sheikh Muhammad Azmat Ali Kakorvi Nami, 1869. A historical sketch of Faisabad by P. Carnegie, 1870. The Gazetteer of the Province of Aud, 1877. Zia Yakhtar by Haji Muhammad Hassan. 1880, the Faisabad Settlement Report, 1880, the Imperial Gazetteer of Faisabad, 1881, and also the Gumash Te Halati Ajodhya Awad by Maulvi Abdul Karim, the Court Verdict of 1886 by Colonel F. E. H. Amir in Muhammad Ashgar's petition, in which he states after a visit to the site, It is most unfortunate that a masjid should have been built on land especially held sacred by Hindus. But as that event occurred about 356 years ago, that is in 1530, it is too late now to remedy the grievance. All that can be done is to maintain the parties in status quo. In 1934, serious Hindu-Muslim clashes broke out in and around the mosque. Many people were killed in the riots and the structure itself was severely damaged. In December 1949, the Hindus held large gatherings of Ramayan recitation in and around the site. On 23rd December 1949, the place was reconsecrated for Rama worship. Between 1975 and 1980, archaeological survey was conducted in and around Ayodhya under the guidance of the then Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, Mr. B. B. Lal. The eminent art historian, Mr. S. P. Gupta, was also a member of this team. We did excavations at uh, three spots right around the Bauri Masjid. Two of these were to the west of the Bauri Masjid and one to the south of the Babri Masjid. And our trenches were hardly two meters away from the outer wall of the Babri Masjid. So in fact, uh, almost touching it. Now this is, here is a photograph of the mosque and the trench on the uh, uh, western side. This is the wall of the mosque. This is of course the peripheral wall, a sort of retaining wall. Now from here downwards, we have different levels. Say the uh, <coughs> early medieval levels, the Kush, uh, Gupta levels, Kushan levels, Shunga levels, and further to the 3rd, 4th century BC. In the deep trench here, uh, which you cannot see right now, we went further down about 7 or 8 feet. And in the lowest levels in this trench, we found uh, material such like uh, the northern black polished ware and other things. 
which go back to about 700 before Christ. This is the lowest deposit and this probably is the time of Lord Ram because similar evidence comes from other places like Shangvirpur, Bharadwaj Ashram, Chitrakoot, uh, which are associated with the Ram story. So, and uh, a similar trench was put on the southern side of the mosque, uh, where again we went uh, to the 7th century BC level, confirming what we get on the other side. In fact, we uh, excavated at 14 places at Ayodhya, so that we did not miss the lowest levels, and we got the same kind of evidence. Well, as I told you, we put a trench on the southern side of the mosque. What you see in this photograph, this is the wall, outer wall of the mosque. This is a recent surface accumulation, but ancient surface is here. As we went about 25 to 30 centimeters below it, we came across a series of pillars. You can see one, two, three, and this one is gone. Another row can be seen sticking out of the section. Now these brick bases are likely to have carried the stone pillars that you now see in the mosque. These are oriented along the cardinal directions, that is north, south, and east, west. Likewise, in the mosque, you see these pillars, they are also oriented along the cardinal direction, east, west, and north, south. These pillars carry typical motive, Hindu motifs, which are found on the pillars in temples. There are sculptures also on them. And stylistically, these pillars are datable to a period around 1100 AD. So there is enough circumstantial evidence to connect these stone pillars with the bases which we saw in the previous photograph, brick bases found in the excavation. And, the and, a, fur and a further work is done uh, there is every chance of getting more evidence from underneath the mosque which will show the collection of these pillars, uh, pillar bases, and the actual pillars. The distance also is of importance, which is more or less the same. Now, you see this stone pillar. The base here is slightly smaller than the base that you have of this brick foundation. And this is as it ought to be. Because normally, uh, for the sake of strength, you have got a much wider base than the base of the actual pillar. The masjid was built over an um, existing Hindu structure. Why were the, the columns left exposed? That happens. Sometimes, uh, if you see uh, in various uh, places where this has been done, plinths and parts of columns still stand. In fact, in Delhi itself, there is the mosque Kuvvatulul Islam. Many of the pillars are still standing there and over that a dome has been put. And this was nothing unusual. You see, when the Muslim uh, invaders uh, came, they naturally wanted to, uh, I mean, a sort of uh, show their strength. And as a result of that, this, uh, there is an inscription in this mosque, the Delhi mosque, known as Kuvatul Islam, that as many as 27 temples were destroyed uh, to produce this mosque. And, uh, uh, the word, very word Kuvvatul Islam means the might of Islam. The whole idea was that the invader must impress upon the invaded that uh, they are powerful. And a sort of a, a terror situation was created by it, which perhaps uh, any invader might do. Now, interesting thing is that this is the destruction level of the, uh, these pillars. And it is from this layer that we found the glazed pottery, which I'll show you presently. And the layer which has the material of destruction is of about 1500 AD or thereabouts, because we have got plenty of glazed pottery from this, which is so typical of the Muslim period in India. You see, this kind of pottery never came into India prior to, say, uh, the 13th century. So the destruction is datable to a period about 1500 AD or so. You can't be more precise than that, because pottery has a much wider range. But the destruction of the structure connected with those pillars uh, took place around that period. Professor, how come this uh, circumstantial evidence has not been brought to light so far? Well, uh, two years ago, I submitted a report uh, to the uh, government through the Director General, 
and uh, maybe they are thinking of publishing it as and when it suits or as and when it is possible. Why it has not been done so far, uh, I really cannot comment on that. If we are given a free hand and asked to excavate below the mosque, it can only be done when the mosque is removed bodily and the whole land is given to us. We hope to get the remains of 84 pillars in the form of bases, which we have already encountered, at least half a dozen of them, in the excavations conducted on the south of this mosque. Seventh of October, 1984, saw a massive gathering of people in Ayodhya. An oath was taken to rebuild the temple at the same site. That, as it now seems in retrospect, was a launching of a movement on a scale unknown since the struggle for independence. Then came the historic event of 1st of February, 1986. On that day, the locks put on the gates of the mosque, way back in 1949, by administrative orders, were removed on the orders of the district judge Fazabah. The judge accepted the plea that the Hindus had had unrestricted access to the site for the past 36 years and that the locks were no longer necessary. According to another observation of the civil judge Fazabad on 23rd of March 1951, the place was never used as a mosque nor was any namaz offered at the site since the year 1936. The next historic event is that of 19th of November 1989. On that day, the foundation laying ceremony, or what is known as the Shilanyas, took place. The event had a symbolic aspect. The first stone was laid by a Harijan. It was intended to signify that what was being laid was not the mere foundation of a temple, but the foundation of an entirely new social order. The year 1990 was a year of swift developments. The whole issue was engulfed in a spate of litigations and negotiations, and of course, political manipulations by various groups and political parties who had their own access to grind in the matter. In the midst of all these developments, it was declared that on 30th of October, 1990, Kar Seva would take place at Ayodhya. Hundreds of thousands of people started gathering in and around Ayodhya. The then UP government of Shimulayam Singh Yadav took unprecedented security measures to prevent people from going to Ayodhya. But people nevertheless reached Ayodhya in spite of the unprecedented security measures and Kar Seva commenced on 30th of October 1990 as planned and as declared. A fresh round of negotiations now began between the AIBMAC and the VHP under the new dispensation. On 1st and 2nd December 1990, preliminary discussions were held to decide the modus operandi of the negotiations. On 22nd December 1990, the AIBMAC and the VHP submitted their respective documents and evidence. On 6th of January 1991, the VHP gave its rejoinder to the AIBMAC statement. The government minutes of the meeting of 6th of January 1991 read, the VHP submitted its rejoinder in which it tried to refute the claims of the AIBMAC point-wise. The AIBMAC did not react to the evidence put forward by the VHP. Since the AIBMAC did not give its comments on the evidence, it is not possible to decide the areas of agreement and disagreement. However, even after the meeting of 24th of January 1991, the AIBMAC had given no rebuttal. The submission of evidence, deliberations, discussions and meetings would go on. But as far as the historical aspect of the matter is concerned, the evidence on record clearly indicates 
that there was a temple on the very site where the mosque stands. Of course, there's no evidence to show that Ram was actually born at the site. But then, in the nature of things, there can be no such evidence. What is, however, significant is that Ram has been held in the highest esteem by generations of Indians for thousands of years. The people of India consider him to be the very personification of the highest ideals of manhood. It is these ideals and virtues which they see reflected in his life and behavior. And it is these ideals and virtues which they worship in the form of Ram. As far as Ram himself is concerned, he made no claims to divinity. He did not pose as a prophet or as a god. In the Valmiki Ramayana, he says about himself, Atmanam manusham manye Ramam dasharat atmanam. He was Ram, the son of Dasharat and a man. And indeed as a man, he lived his life. But what a man. A man of extraordinary capabilities. He is known as Mariada Purushottam which does not mean a person with limitations, but rather to the contrary. It means a person who is capable of reaching to the very limits of human endeavor in every walk of life. As a child, he craved for the moon. As a son, he unflinchingly obeyed his father. As a strategist in war, he befriended Vibhishan, the brother of his enemy. As a friend of Sugriv, he killed Wali though he had no personal reason to do so. And as a husband, he fought the most brutal war to rescue his wife from the clutches of Rava. If such a person is worshipped for thousands of years and people genuinely and passionately believe that he took birth at a particular place in Ayodhya, then that ideal called Ram deserves a monument, not for himself, but for his worshippers. Friends, we would consider our efforts to have been fruitful if we have succeeded, as I said in the beginning, to present the information before you in a manner that would help you to form your own opinion. We can then consider our mandate well served. Thank you very much. <laughs>